What is the way where light dwells and darkness? What place is it? Job asked this ancient question, and its answer is the revelation of St. John. The story of the apocalypse tells of a series of catastrophes that befall the earth at the end of time. These catastrophes have both physical and psychological effects, and they are presented in the form of an allegory. In this story, the consummation of the war between good and evil is played out to a finish. At the last, the world is destroyed by fire, and Christ comes again to raise and judge the dead, to reward the good, to punish the evil, to create a new heaven and a new earth, and to unite his church to himself forever. In this part, we want to compare compositional studies taken from several different apocalypse manuscripts in order to discover the analogies present there. While the line drawings are faithful to their originals, their color has been greatly simplified. This study is taken from the Abingdon Apocalypse in the British Library collections. At the end of the world, a global ruler is prophesied to come who is absolutely opposed to Christ. He is to be the very personification of evil. We see this Antichrist and his nefarious activity characterized here. Are you surprised he is pictured here as a gentleman? But in prophecy, the Antichrist rules the world at first by deceit and at last by force. He sits here astride the border, separating two realms of existence to express his preternatural nature, partly human and partly demonic. He towers over the others, both in size and position, which is an analogy for his power. And here we see his satanic inspiration pictured as a little devil whispering in his ear. Everyone is subject to him and very much afraid. These men are subsumed in the false worship of this father of lies, which separates them from the objective reality enclosed in the borders of the larger scene. These figures are not soldiers, although they do the soldier's work, because the Antichrist will set every man against his neighbor. The soldiers of the Antichrist are trampling down a disarmed and unresisting populace. Here we see an emblem which is an analogy of the anguish of his cruelty, being spread abroad like a burning wind. You can see here a reference to the stage as a building construction. This slain figure is shown with his feet extruding from the border to express that his life is not confined to this world. The weapons of these figures extend beyond the borders, suggesting their power is somehow preternatural. This white figure stands outside the border and operates within it to signify that he is motivated by destructive forces outside normal experience. All of these conflicting references to the meaning of the margin suggest that in this painting, the margin is not an analogy for only one kind of separated realm of existence, but of all realms other than the one shown to be inside the border. This study is also taken from a painting of the Abingdon Apocalypse. Here we see the persecution of the church, which was foretold by Christ in the Gospels, and also by Saints Peter, Paul, and John. The Old Testament prophets also made many references to this greatest of persecutions by prefiguration. Here we see the actual structure of the church being hammered down by what appear to be civil servants. At least we see they are inferiors of the soldiers because they are smaller in scale and have no uniforms. The Christians remain inside the church at the altar of God and the priest still holds the Eucharistic body of Christ in his hand. But they are obviously no match physically for the giant soldiers. Devils gleefully join in and urge on this destruction. In fact, all the destroyers are happy to be doing their work. 
This joy is an analogy for the esprit de corps between the citizens of the world and the forces of the devil. The soldiers are standing on a cloud of dust or rubble. Because it is connected to, but not part of the church, this is an analogy for what is left of 2,000 years of Christian civilization at the time of the Antichrist. Again, we see their weapons and even their toes extend beyond the borders to suggest a preternatural influence from another realm. This zealot here is so embroiled in his destructive fury that his head and shoulders protrude out of this world and into the same psychological space from which this little devil originates. The toes of this faithful Christian gently touch out of the scene as well, showing even in this extreme danger, he is anchored to a higher level of existence. The floor of the stage of this painting is represented by this gray border here, which excludes the church, but extends all around the rest of the picture. It represents the earth, the platform of all worldly action. The center space of the painting represents the sky and is therefore analogous to the mind, that is, the arena in which the force of ideas clash and wrestle for predominance. Composing this painting so that the sky is at the heart of the picture makes an analogy of the fact that the Antichrist seeks control not only of the body, but the minds of his victim. It is interesting to note that while the gray border of physical action extends both above, below, and beside the soldiers, inside the church, the realm of the mind or the spirit, fills all the unoccupied space. This anomality presents for us an analogy of the spirit reigning in the church while coercive force reigns in the world of action. Perhaps the latter represents the irrational motives of these men, which carries them in the performance of their evil deeds beyond the stings of conscience. This next study is taken from the Angers Apocalypse, which is a magnificent set of tapestries created by Jean Bandol very late in the Middle Ages. Here we see St. John standing in the shelter of the church before his vision of a seven-headed dragon with ten horns. This is the image of Satan, who has been cast out of heaven to the earth because of his rebellion against God. This woman, like the Blessed Virgin Mary, is an analogy of the church. Her child represents both Christ and faith in Christ because Christ is born of Mary and the faith is born of the church. They are both shown here in the heaven of the mind where faith dwells. This altar from which inspiring angels come represents the indwelling sacred heart of Christ because by analogy, he sacrificed himself on the altar of the cross for piety and for the love of man. The Apocalypse tells us that Satan, in the analogical form of a dragon, brings down a third of the stars of heaven with his tail, which are analogies for the other rebel angels, and on another level, for the heretics and rebellious of the church. The horizon line is very low here because the main event of this painting is a vision which takes place in this cloud-bordered field of the sky. The dragon joins these two separate realms of existence with his penetrating heads. This analogical device illustrates his desire to devour the newborn child, that is, to become worshipped as God in his stead. This is also an analogy for the influence of Satan, which is able to insinuate itself into even the Christian mind. This study is taken from the Trinity Apocalypse of Trinity College at Cambridge University. The subject of this painting is the plight of the church in its struggle against Satan. 
This woman is the same analog of the church we saw in the previous painting. She is shown in a wilderness which has been abbreviated to these few gnarled trees. Here she is secluded from the pursuit of Satan and nourished by the blessed sacrament at the hands of an angel. The river lapping at her hymns represents a flood of lies and lying wonders said in the apocalypse to be vomited from the mouth of Satan purposely to engulf her. She is raised into the serene spiritual realm above the border, which marks, by analogy, the limit of worldly affairs. In the adjacent realm, we see the saints of the church in active combat with Satan. They stand on the world stage, which is represented by the outer border, because this persecution happens in the real world and in real time. But we know that this combat is spiritual because their point of contact is in the sky, the realm of the mind. These poor souls are fighting with all they have. Their weapons are analogies for that comprehension of the faith by which Christian souls resist all doubt. This simple woman has in her possession only the rock of Peter with which to defend herself. And here we see a figure among the Christians who tries to prevent the others from resisting Satan's influence. These two paintings, so completely different in appearance, show the very same subject. The first study is taken from the Visio Sancti Pali Apocalypse in the Parker Library at Cambridge. Here we see St. John appalled by a company of monsters who are marching to the assistance of this very remarkable figure. He is a mutant creature, adorned with bat wing, a lion's tail, and the talons of a bird. If his big head, a universal symbol of pride, and his foul bestiality did not tip us off, surely his irrational expression would suggest him to represent no saintly character. St. John tells us that his name is, in fact, the Exterminator, the very angel of the abyss who ascends out of the bottomless pit of hell at the head of this army of monsters to torment the perfidious peoples of the earth. This next study is taken from the Alger tapestries. Here we see St. John as if hiding in the church from the fearful spectacle of this vision. These monsters, called locusts in the apocalypse, are shown here coming out of the bottomless pit Compared to the previous painting, this exterminator looks more like the king he is described to be in the apocalypse, but far less malicious. The angelic herald of these calamities is shown still within the realm of heaven, but his trumpet, as if bent by the friction between heaven's cloud frill and our sky, extends its resounding alarm. Two levels of analogy are in operation here, as images of natural locusts accompany these creatures of hell to signify their name, while the monsters themselves characterize perverting, rapacious forces which are being set loose upon mankind. Here again we compare paintings of the same motif. They both represent the two witnesses of God who preach to the whole world at the end of time and clarify the differences between good and evil. But they are at last killed by the Antichrist, and their bodies lie in the streets for three days before they are resurrected, while all the perfidious of the earth celebrate their seeming destruction. The first painting is able to communicate the cause of these people's rejoicing by a manipulation of location. These revelers, who by their diminutive scale are shown to be spiritually inferior to their huge victims, celebrate the death of their enemies by dancing directly upon them. The size of the witnesses in this painting is absolutely mythic, and this grandeur clearly represents their extraordinary role. Relationships of scale are directly related to the meaning of medieval paintings. This artist by increasing the size of the two witnesses, has followed the principle, but has not fully understood it.
by placing the smaller figures at some distance behind the larger, they do not seem so much to be smaller people, but only further away. And so the analogy of scale to grandeur is destroyed. Okay. To avoid this confusion, medieval artists often place smaller figures in front of or directly beside larger figures to emphasize the spiritual meaning of their size. This aberration of nature is a certain sign of the analogy of prestige. This study, which is from the Trinity Apocalypse, shows men being forced to worship the Antichrist, represented here by the analogy of a seven-headed beast. Those who refuse are being executed. By having one group with its back to the other group, an analogy is made of the tension between their contradictory persuasions. The one group worships, and the other, refusing to worship, give their lives for the faith. No figure here escapes the confines of the border, which is an analogy for the absolute power of the Antichrist over life and death at the end of the world. When this world ends, so ends man's rebellion against the goodness and justice of God. But this rebellion has been deeply destructive. The apostasy and immorality that seem to prevail against the church in the end times provokes God's judgments. His wrath is portrayed in analogy by the plagues of the apocalypse. This study from the Angers Tapestry shows St. John weeping for pity as fire falls from heaven burning on land and sea. This painting is very dramatic, yet a very spare representation of the text. In this study from the Dew Apocalypse, we see a star has fallen at the angel's trumpet blast and has poisoned all the water. Many men are sick and many have died. Showing the deceased by their unburied heads distinguishes them from those who are merely sick, and so the devastation of the plague is more keenly realized. The heaven above, represented by these clouds, seems to be vacant, an analogy to the unanswered prayers of hypocrites and the impenitent. This angel is clearly the major player here. He extends through three levels of reality, and by pouring out his vial in heaven upon earth, he is initiating this abbreviated depiction of a total devastation of the world. The sentence, Fac tu est, is spoken from the temple of God, it is finished. And so the abuse of power has been turned to its own punishment. These heads represent voices originating from heaven who command the rain to hail stones. And man, without mercy, is crushed from above and below as the earth quakes in fear of the indignation of God. This study from the Trinity Apocalypse shows all evil operations and operators under the analogy of the wicked city Babylon. Here we see its miserable collapse, and at the same time, we see these Christians leaving from its gates. They have been commanded by heaven to come out of it. The artist is not telling you that when the city collapses, the gates remain standing. Rather, he is showing two different episodes concerning this same city linked together anachronistically, that is, out of the sequence of real time. This wide border represents the real world, where all the peoples move and stand. But the evil city is founded on the lowest edge to suggest its origin is connected to the infernal regions of the earth. From these examples, we see that not every detail described in the text is necessarily realized in these paintings while remaining true to the essential analogies presented in sacred scripture, each artist has great freedom in the selection and orchestration of the contributing elements of his picture. Both of these studies were taken from paintings in the Trinity Apocalypse. They both show battle scenes described in two separate visions, yet both may represent the same subject 
shown under different analogies. Throughout sacred scripture, one same reality may be shown in contrasting analogies and by various prophets. These, though quite different from each other, describe the same specific revelation under different aspects. The first painting represents the universal church, besieged by those of the nations whom Satan has seduced. We know the church, which is open to all, does not have the character of a fort, but the dogma of the church is truly a barrier to apostasy. And from this comparison, we can easily deduce the meaning of this image. We see here the faithful secured behind the protecting walls of the unchanging dogmas of our faith. Remaining within the analogy of the church, we see these souls have only their trumpets to defend themselves, because proclaiming the gospel is the whole duty of the church. Their ultimate victory is foreshadowed by these deserters and the slain. Here fire falls from heaven to consume the perfidious, whose burning hatred of God expires in its scorching rain. This painting represents the issue of the famous Battle of Armageddon. The armies of the Antichrist have come against the glorified Christ in this one last attempt to crush the faith and the moral law. The text tells us they are defeated by the sword of his mouth, and we see them here as if blown away by the force of his word. Here we see birds of prey, which we may suppose to be analogies of evil spirits, because both share the invisible medium of the air and prey upon the weak. They are prophesied in the Apocalypse to consume the remains of this army of evildoers who were in open rebellion against God. In both analogies, Satan is shown vanquished and forced into hell. The location of the angels in each painting presents us with a difference that suggests a further analogical comparison. Perhaps the angel in the cloud frill tells us that the powers of heaven prevail over Satan while the angel standing in the mouth of hell tells us that the powers of heaven prevail over Satan and even over hell itself, illustrating the associated verse, and hell and death were cast into the pool of fire. God has promised a new heaven and a new earth when the old with its sorrows has passed away. The life of this new world is described in the apocalypse under the analogy of a beautiful city coming down from heaven and prepared by God as a bride adorned for her husband. This study from the Angers tapestry simply shows the New Jerusalem as a fine medieval city, pressing the analogy of similarity. In this study from the Bodleian Duo Apocalypse, only three gates of this city are shown. Rather than a full description of it, this artist features here the little drama of St. John and the angel by whose help he is able to foresee the New Jerusalem. This is a famous painting of the New Jerusalem from the Trinity Apocalypse. It has been abstracted to faithfully represent the four square measurements of the city detailed in the sacred scripture. In order to show all the gates described there, the artist shows the city in a completely schematic way. Although this painting is much more visually simple than the others, it shows a much greater wealth of information about New Jerusalem. Here the realms of being are respected in a very original way. We see Christ enthroned within the border of his eternity at the heart of the city and accompanied by his own image as Lamb of God. The river of life flows from his throne to germinate the trees planted there for the healing of the nations. All is represented with the utmost simplicity. In this painting, John and the angel are included almost as an afterthought. And last of all, we are looking at a painting from the Abingdon Apocalypse, which represents analogically a number of related concepts that together express the ultimate victory of Christ Jesus our Lord. 
here we see not only Christ as victor, but the reason for his victory. He is victorious because he is resurrected, the firstborn of the dead, and because he vanquishes hell, and because he sets the captives free. He is victorious because he holds the world in the palm of his hand and executes judgment by his two-edged sword of punishment and reward, crowning the church and Our Lady with his love. Here the entire realm of the Hellmouth has become the possession of the risen Christ. Angels prevent this soul from falling into hell, catching him by his hair, which is perhaps a medieval way of saying by the skin of his teeth. The imprisoning gates of hell are shown to be broken down, and the liberated souls rejoice in God their Savior.